and I'm waiting. Okay, it looks like we're live. So everybody, just give me a thumbs up if you have sound. This is John Haller from Fellowship Bible Chapel. Hang on a second here. Okay, and um, I'm with Nicole Jensa Jean. Is that how you say your name? No, it's pretty good. Well, what would you say? John says Jan. John says John. Okay, see, I don't have the, I say it like a Midwesterner would say it. It, it took me a couple of years to get it, you know. <laughs> you could have just left Nicole, you know, Nicole Ness or something like this. So Nicole is a journalist, lives in Jerusalem. I uh, met her at the Christian Media Summit about, well, almost two years ago now, uh, back in December of 2022. We kind of hung out at the Knesset the day we uh, they took us over there. Uh, she's become a good friend, uh, lives in Jerusalem with her family, husband, three children. And uh, Nicole, welcome. Thank you. Thank you so uh, much, John. Okay, so Nicole, uh, is anything, I'll ask you a stupid question, uh, which I'm good at. Um, I was trained by the best lawyers to ask stupid questions. Um, is anything going on in Jerusalem these days? Well, maybe not such a stupid question, John, because it is a Jewish holiday and this is the Jewish state and it's really quiet in Jerusalem today. Like it's like a it's like a Shabbat, which on Shabbat everything shuts down. But yeah, it's it's quiet here in Jerusalem. It's quiet in most of the country, but a, according to all of the alerts I'm getting on my phone, it's not quiet in the north. And you've got the ongoing battle between Israel and Hezbollah up north, actually. That's that's going on. I haven't even checked my uh, Red Alert app this morning. Uh, I, I've seen a lot of things pop up. Uh, and maybe I'll put up a, a screenshot of my app in a moment. Uh, so talk to us about the other night. I mean, you live in Jerusalem, and I was getting videos and messages and everything from friends in Jerusalem when during the Iranian missile attack the other night. Yeah. Um, tell me what you experienced, what you saw, what happened? Yeah. Well, it's, uh, I'm going to start with earlier in the day because it was like nothing that we had experienced before, especially in Jerusalem. I mean, I have to say like Jerusalem has been the safe place during this war. So, which started almost a year ago today. Uh, so during the day, um, at around two o'clock, the uh, the Israel Home Front Command just changed their restrictions, like like just like in, in a snap, and they said, and they go into effect immediately. And the restrictions covered almost the entire country, including Jerusalem. They said no gatherings of this many people. You know, it was a low number of people, like 30 people outdoors, which basically shut down the Western Wall. And this is the time that people are going to for prayers because it's right before the Jewish holidays and it's the prayers for forgiveness that are going on for the entire month. So that shut down. Events were canceled. The kids um, we're getting messages like uh, your, you know, basketball is canceled and this and gymnastics is canceled. And like all um, one uh, one of my kids goes to an after school program. They said we're moving up the buses by by an hour. And I was like, wow, this is pretty serious. Then we heard that the uh, cabinet, the uh, Israeli cabinet um, of the Knesset was going to be meeting in in Jerusalem in an underground bunker. And I was like, all right. So everything was adding up to like, things are really serious. Now, Iran had been saying that it needs to retaliate for a threat um, or for um, the assassination of, of uh, the Hezbollah leader, Hassan Nasrallah, that happened on, on September 27th. And Iran had not up until then retaliated. So, um, so it seemed like a pretty random day. This was October 1st. And uh, a couple of days later, and but the intelligence that Israel must have had, and also I, I heard that it came also as a warning from the U.S., was that it's going to happen and it's going to happen soon. So from two o'clock that afternoon until um, it, it was around, I think it was around seven thirty in the in the evening when the sirens started, and they actually started. At, like all over the country, it started with an emergency warning on your phone, and then the entire country 
got the um, got the alerts. You know, I, I I was watching the the messages pour in, like you know, Jerusalem area, Haifa area, South Beersheba, um, the Gaza envelope, the North, everything. The entire country was sent to a bomb shelter, and so you know, we went to the shelter when we got to our the shelter that's on the first on the ground floor of our building. There were about 40 people already there because it was seven o'clock in the evening. There was a people at a restaurant next door. There were there were people walking walking by on the street. And so we had like 40 people in a really small space. And we were in there for about well, more than a half hour. But you just heard, you know, as soon as we shut the door, you started hearing like these explosions and not being an expert. I couldn't tell you if those were if they um uh, they made a hit or if it was uh, the interceptions overhead. Yeah, you could see like, so this. Yeah, that, that that's the, the that's the warning that came out about the time you just said yep. uh, that covered the entire country of Israel. Yeah. It, I, I mean, that was, I, I didn't even experience it like this the tension leading up to it and then the sirens as we did in April when Iran lost uh, launched the drone drone strike so there were a few key differences here so the with the drones you have 12 hour advance notice about um or 9 hours 9 hours um that uh, from the time they're launched from Iran to the time they're going to get into Israeli airspace and 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 so we had that warning and it was a very slow moving night until the sirens finally went off back in April. This was really fast. And these ballistic missiles, they only sent ballistic missiles. They sent 180, more than 180, between 180 and 200. And they only take 12 minutes from the time they leave Iran to the time they get to Israel. That's why by the time we got to the shelter, we heard explosions already. So that was pretty insane. And it went on for a, a long time. Um, I, I'm sure that you've, you, I'm sure you were reported on this already because it's, it's a couple of days ago, but you know, in case people don't know, there was only one person who was killed in all of you know the land here, um, and it was a Palestinian in Jericho, and uh, and he wasn't in a shelter. And you know you saw like you see unfortunately the the footage uh, that was caught on a CCTV camera where he's he's just crossing a street and the the missile just falls right there in the street. So he was the the only casualty of this. Um, and there, there was some damage to homes and to a school. And also, um, Israel just acknowledged today that there was actually damage to some mil military installations. Um, there, it, there was one missile that landed in a hangar, and or or shrapnel, perhaps. And and then there was um, an, another in a, another area, like a storage facility on a military base. So. So this is the first um, the first time that we've seen actual potential military damage. Now, of course, that was I Iran's revenge, and they said, "Okay, we we you know they they acknowledged, they announced, we did it, we took our revenge, and uh, Israel better not respond to our response because you know then it's it's going to get ugly." Now, Israel has said we will respond at the time and with the method of our choosing. And also Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said Iran made a big mistake. And he's been saying, and also the defense minister, they've been saying that uh, whoever attacks us, we will attack them. And and you can see, they're, they're saying now, you can see how far we can get. And so these are veiled threats at Iran and uh, at the Ayatollahs, at the president, you know, just saying, look, we, we know where, where you are and you know what we can do. So when you say you can see how far we can get, let's, let's explain. Let's explain a couple things, too, about how uh, I'm not sure that Iron Dome was really used that much in this particular mat, uh, attack, because I think Iron Dome is limited to rockets and short-range missiles, not ballistic missiles. So for this, they would use 
uh, David Sling, David Sling or Arrow yeah. Three, probably Arrow Three, mm -hmm. and um, so there. It, it, people need to understand. You're going to see a lot of videos, particularly on the pro Iranian, pro Muslim, anti Israel, Jew hating media, uh, particularly on Twitter and other social media, Telegram and elsewhere. The it is a sewer of Jew and Israel hatred. It is unbelievable to me. And I've seen a lot of, of propaganda. Oh, uh, Iran destroyed the Nevitem Air Base down in the Negev where they have a bunch of F-35 fighters, you know, and those fighters are incredibly expensive. Israel has a limited, I think they might have 38 of them that they've modified to actually be better than what the ones that the United States uh, Air Force has. But I'm not aware of any being destroyed. I've checked with a lot of sources in Israel. I think it's propaganda. But there were a lot of, well, there was, there's one video that's very deceptively edited. And I don't know if you've seen it. It shows all of these missiles hitting and exploding. But what you don't see is that a lot of those missiles had been struck by the Arrow 3 missiles. And that was the missile falling down. And in case people don't know, when Aero 3 or Iron Dome or David Sling operate, when the missile is launched, the there these things are very sophisticated, controlled uh, co by computers and technology. They have algorithms that calculate the distance, speed, and where that's going to fall. And then that's overlaid on a pretty detailed map of Israel as to, okay, is that an open space? If it's an open space, we're going to let it hit because you know it's very expensive fifty hundred thousand dollars to fire to shoot down a missile uh so they let it explode and, but of course the propaganda is oh look at it hitting all these areas i even saw one propaganda channel this is a gentleman who claims to be jewish who is, i don't even know if i want to say his name because he's i find him to be so despicable and distasteful he said oh it's clear nothing happened so this was a joint operation between Iran and the Israeli government to a, a sort of a false flag to get um, all the countries in the Middle East and the world to go to war so the industri military industrial complex can make money. It was, it's a ridiculous, if you're listening, if you know who this person is, he has turned into a complete moron and i don't know how else to say it but anyway so there's a lot of propaganda out there so i interrupted you so that they did a great job shooting them down there was i know there was one school that was hit somewhere uh but the damage was fairly minimal yeah uh, yeah i mean compared to the number of of um missiles that were sent the fact that they were ballistic missiles if you see the size of these things uh you know they're they're enormous yeah. even the shrapnel like when they get shot down and they break into pieces the pieces are still enormous but this could have done a lot of damage but all you know it a lot of uh, there would have been a lot more casualties if people weren't in their bomb shelters because restaurants you know you see the glass shatter shattered in restaurants you saw like at, at people's homes that there was uh, no no direct hits but, you know, if a piece of shrapnel falls and then just kind of like from the explosion, w windows and, and maybe a little bit of fire and whatever. But, um, you know, so but no casualties. I mean, it was miraculous. But about, you know, what you were saying, like about the uh, the anti-Israel sentiment, you want to know something. There's a Palestinian that I follow on on uh, Twitter, and he he posted his concern. He lives in America now. He posted his concern for his family that lives in the West Bank near Ramallah, because they are also under the same fire. I mean, the, these these missiles don't differentiate between what would be a Palestinian territory and what would be an Israeli land and and so he said that i'm very concerned for for my family and for all innocent people that might be under fire he actually got death threats for being a sellout because he actually expressed concern for other human beings his family but also for 
it for Israelis that would actually be hit. So I so it's it's definitely gone too far. And and I think he said it best uh, when he explained if you think if you cannot sympathize with an innocent human being, then please don't take up my cause. And please don't he's, you know, coming from a Palestinian angle. And he said, like, don't don't then, you know, don't go for um don't take up my my Palestinian cause if you can't actually love and respect and honor the lives of all innocent people. And I I can't believe anyway, he he got death threats over actually sympathizing with innocent people who were in the line of fire of this missile attack. So um, you mentioned so this is Rosh Hashanah. Mm -hmm. or, uh, ha, uh, feast day, feast of trumpets. Uh, and I think that's a special Shabbat that'll run till what sundown tonight. Oh, this is going to go on. Till okay, Saturday night. Saturday okay. night, actually. And then, and then you go a week out. Like next week is uh, Yom Kippur. Yep. And also Monday is the one day or the one year anniversary of the Gaza attack. Yeah. So <laughs> I put up a map here so people can kind of. Uh, get an idea. Let me zoom in a little bit. So Jerusalem is in this area here, sort of that little in that dotted curve line area. Um, so I've been told that over the past month, and I don't know if this is unusual or not, it's just what somebody in Jerusalem told me, was that a lot of people, a lot of Jews have been going to the Kotel, to the Western Wall, and praying over the last month in in numbers that this person said they've never seen. Did you have you observed that? Uh, I definitely observed that they're going. I didn't. I don't know if it's more than usual, but for sure, uh, every night it's been packed, and that is a traditional thing that they do. It's in uh, leading up to the Day of Atonement, which is Yom Kippur. Okay, so. Um, what do you think? And now you mentioned that the the cabinet has been meeting in a special session. Uh, Iran's making all sorts of threats. Uh, the Ayatollah he put up a a picture. I'll have, I'll see if I can I can pull that out and put that up. Uh, I've seen interviews on Sky News with these Iranian professors from a university in Tehran saying that uh, Israel's Israel is toast. Israel is going to end. Uh, we have tens of thousands of missiles and we can launch them and Israel can't do anything to stop them. So what do you think? And I read an article by my friend Jonathan Spire this morning that, you know, Israel probably will strike back in a big way. So what what's the sense of what you hear or see? Well, what people are saying is the assumption is they're going to hit oil refineries and perhaps the nu uh, nuclear sites, you know, anything to do uh, with the nuclear program to sort of set it back. Uh, so that that's what the, the talk is. I, I do wonder if they'll go a little bit further and also aim for uh, specific leaders, uh, whether in the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps or whether they'll go for the president or the supreme leader himself. I mean, of course, they must be under guard, I'm sure, some kind of uh, serious guard. But yeah, I just wonder if it, if Israel will take it up a notch and, and go not just for sites and for damaging damaging sites, but also would go for leaders. They, they have assassinated most of the military leadership of Hezbollah and also uh, of Hamas. Uh, in Gaza. So there's, there are a lot of operatives left. Hamas was, you know, made up of 100,000 people. And uh, so, you know, 100,000 fighters, operatives, whatever. Um, and so if they even killed, let's say, five to 10,000, obviously, they still have a huge force. Now they're grappling with communications failures. Um, and of course, uh, Iran is still trying to supply uh, Hezbollah, which is its biggest proxy. They're still trying to supply them. 
So, so Israel's also targeting, by the way, uh, weapons, um, you know, maybe possible weapons lines that are going through Syria in, into Lebanon. So that's going on. But as far as like what else they could attack in, in Iran, I think it'd be very interesting. It'll be interesting to see what they do and how they do it. And if they truly are responsible for the assassination of Ismail Haniya, who was in Tehran, he's the, he was the head of Hamas, and he was killed in his hotel room in Tehran in July. So if Israel truly did that, as most people believe they did, they didn't take responsibility for it, but if they truly did that, I, I wonder what they cannot reach and who they cannot reach over there. Also, uh, we would have to look at like the IRGC in the world you know, where are they? They operate in many different countries, even undercover. So, you know, there's a lot of possibilities. And I don't even begin to fathom what, listen, between the walkers, I know, walkie talkies and the pagers and everything, which you know, I'm sure you know about from like, was it two weeks ago, two and a half weeks ago? I, I, it, things are moving so fast and they're so, um, the attacks are unique. Like if you made a movie about this, people wouldn't believe the movie. So I wonder what they have up their sleeve. <laughs> well, I said that in one of my updates was that first of all, the, uh, the, the sequence of the pager attack, uh, and the injuries, a lot of hundreds of these guys being blinded because they picked up yeah. their pager to look at it, followed a long series of statements by Nasrallah and others, uh, on Al Manar and Al Akbar newspaper in Lebanon, that I follow pretty closely. That you know they were doing these attacks on uh, Mount Marone and the uh, Unit eighty two hundred base up in the Galilee because we're blinding Israel, and then the Pager attacks happens, and b a bunch of their upper leadership and their foot soldiers are blinded and disabled and that type of thing in the attack, and then the next day at the funerals. Uh, walkie-talkies and other devices started exploding. And I think more were killed the second day than had been killed the first day. I mean, it was yeah. a study. And so then uh, Hezbollah goes to, okay, well, we got to go to paper and meeting in person. So the Al Radwan Brigade, which was meeting to the, to plan, make the final plans for an invasion of the Galilee, similar to the Gaza invasion yeah. through tunnels and everything to kidnap people. They were meeting in Beirut and then a big, I don't know, missile or bomb took out that building and killed all of the upper le leadership. Mm -hmm. Now, the interesting thing is you may not have seen this yet today since you actually have a life uh, <laughs> with children and that type of thing. And But Christian Amapur had on the on her program, had on the man who I, I would call him the pretend prime minister of Lebanon, you know, that because right. Lebanon doesn't really have a government. Right. I, I forget what the guy's name is. Makati. And, Makati. And I'm pretty sure that's who it was. It might have been the pretend foreign minister, but I think it was Makati. And he said, well, you know that when the miss when the bombs hit Nasrallah, he was ready to pick up the phone. He had already agreed to a 21 day ceasefire. And also when Israel took out Hania in Tehran, he was there to meet with the Iranian government about agreeing to a ceasefire. So this is the latest uh, I the propaganda is just absolutely shocking that I'm seeing being sent out by, by particularly by the Iranian side. I mean, they're masters at it. They're, they're very good. Um, now, let me ask you, if you've heard about this. There was supposedly an, a, a fairly large attack on an air base in Syria last night. Have you heard about that? Yes. yes. Okay. What, what do you know about that? Well, I, what I know about, you know, what I've been able to gather is that whatever was hit caused some secondary explosions that were huge. It looked like, you know, just this big uh, fireball that went up and then secondary explosions. So people are saying that it possibly was um, weapons that were on their way to uh, from Iran through Syria to Hezbollah. Well, I think Jonathan Spire pointed out 
I saw an interview with him at JNS the other day, and he said, "There's so we all talk about it. I forget who I talked to. Well, you know, is uh, has." Hezbollah had 150,000 missiles, rockets, drones, whatever, when this started. They've shot off, at that time, they had shot off about 10,000. It's quite a bit more now. But, and so they only have 135,000 left. But I don't think that's the way the math works because they're continually being resupplied by uh, the mullahs in Iran are resupplying them with missiles, just like the mullahs are supplying Russia with missiles to use in Ukraine. So they, um, and so in, as Jonathan pointed out, I think correctly, there's nothing to stop Tehran from resupplying on, through the land corridor. Cause they effectively control Iraq. They control parts of Syria. That's part of the reason why our troops are around up around, uh, uh, Dar al Zor in North Eastern Syria, to kind of interrupt the flow of that, but I'm not sure we're having much effect on that. So mm -hmm. um, what's the feeling in Israel about, are they viewing some of what's happened as directed by God, you know, as sort of a miracle as to what's happened? Uh, well, I think there is a sense of, euphoria among Israelis for what has happened. Now, do I think that they all um, attribute that to God or the success to God? Unfortunately, no. Um, but this euphoria, I, I have to say, um, we've seen this before. Um, when Israel rescued a hostage, he was it was back at the end of August, I believe, uh, they rescued one hostage and and so there were, the country you know was was ecstatic about that and then just 2 days later they find the bodies of six other hostages that were executed so i see again the euphoria that has gone on like you know that that it looks like um Israel has turned the tables that finally, instead of sort of languishing like in, in Gaza, which by the way is still going on, there's still a ground war in Gaza, but instead of just languishing there in Gaza, now you've got, it looks like the upper hand, like you've, you've you know, first the pagers, then the walkie talkies, then other major targeted assassinations, then Nasrallah himself. And then the and the um, the airstrikes continue, very targeted, precise airstrikes. But there's a danger in that, and the danger is, like you said, um, Hezbollah. Let's say they lost ten thousand rockets, and let's say even we don't know how many the Air, Israeli Air Force may have taken out. I don't know if they know or if anybody knows. You know, they're they're hitting uh, weapons storage facilities, and they're hitting houses that supposedly have also weapons in them. So while you may have depleted their supply and while you have definitely the leadership, um, you know, decimated, you still have a serious force that's backed by Iran. And you have a force that knows that uh, this was coming. They're not unprepared for scenarios like this. They are a trained militia. And there is... Um, there, there are Israeli ground incursions going on. It hasn't been announced like this big thing, like we're starting the ground war. Like sort of with Gaza, it was more like an announcement, like now we begin the ground phase. This is, um, Israel has called up a lot of troops even more over the last couple of days. We've already had several soldiers, like Israel's had several soldiers killed already. And- um, I think and eight, eight were killed, yeah, announced think, killed yesterday in Lebanon. Yeah. Yeah, and I think um, there might there might have been more battles also overnight. So we, you know, there's they're they're not unprepared. In fact, they probably have traps set all over southern Lebanon. So I I think Israel needs to be cautious, or Israelis need to be cautious. I'm sure the military, you know, is another story. They they know what what they know things we don't know. But the Israeli people uh, would have to be cautious and not have this sense of euphoria. We won. It's over. Uh, you know, there's, there's going to be a very long and drawn out battle. You know, this battle with Gaza, the war with Gaza has gone on for a year. And though, um, 
Gaza is decimated and, you know, there's a huge, um, I, I don't know whatever happens to the people that, that are living. I mean, when, when does Gaza get rebuilt? Because it, the war isn't over and there's people mm -hmm. that are living in tents and, um, and there are still 101 hostages from Israel over there. So that's not over and nobody's looking at that. Everybody's looking at Lebanon. And I think what we're looking at in, in Lebanon could if, if Gaza lasted a year, I think Lebanon um, will be at least a half a year and if not um, way longer. So it, it's it's instead of being euphoric over one incident, uh, you, you have to remember, like I think Israelis would be good to, to remember that you're running a marathon, not a sprint. Yeah, it's uh, pretty troubling. I'll show you a, a video. I don't know if this video will show up, but I'm going to try it um and we didn't even get to the houthis who by the way still oh yeah drones that are getting closer and closer to the airport by the way every time they send right and i what's the status of international flights coming in from i mean most no, most airlines good. have canceled yeah no not good at all um you know if you if you want to be assured if you're in Israel and you're trying to get out, you want to be assured your flight's not going to get canceled. So the only airline you book is El Al at the moment. So this is a video that I found on Twitter, this IDF video of um, Southern Lebanon uh, tunnel takeout. And you can see the secondary explosions. And this is the border. I'm going to guess that's up near Rosh Hanikra, uh, and that's the Mediterranean in the background. Uh, along the Lebanon border. And I mean, this is just, this goes like this all the way to Beirut, mm -hmm. um, these tunnels. It's, and they've been building them for 40 years. They're drilled through bedrock. So this is a very long, drawn out, difficult operation. I've interviewed a bunch of people from Alma Research up there in the north. And this is a, uh, this is a very, uh, very difficult situation that Israel's facing. So, uh, let me ask you just a couple more questions. I've got an interview on Stand Up for the Truth in about 20 minutes, so I need to actually think about what I'm going to say there. But um, what do you what do you follow? I mean, where can you recommend that people would go to get good quality news and that type of thing about what's going on over there to kind of get away from the the noise and the noise from both sides to be honest all right aside from my channel sure, of course yes they yeah. can right yeah, but you could you could follow mine you could follow it's, uh, if you're on youtube it's at nicoleness and okay I, I do lives um as events warrant which sometimes is like every night um but but then other times it is not so uh so you can you know feel free to follow me but i will tell you that I like to follow a lot of sources. Um, so from Israel, the, I I like the Times of Israel. It would be my first go-to. And, and then I really try to find some Arab sources uh, as well, because I like to know what the, the other perspective is. And um, so there's you just have to be careful and you have to know in advance. Like for, for instance, if you're if you read Arab news, that it's called Arab News. Um, that is a Saudi backed website. So you're going to get Saudi government um, narrative and thinking. I, of, I do also look at, like you were saying, the, the sites like Almanar and um, Marayin, oh. you know, to also see like, you know, what the what what is Lebanon saying, not not just Lebanon, what's the Hezbollah media saying. I haven't found a good English Palestinian channel, but for that, you could go to Israeli sources like 972 uh, magazine and and then you it, it's real I do feel it's really important to also get like the the you have to get the Palestinian perspective, get the Arab perspective um, or the perspective from the Arab world. I, I was very surprised. I guess I I mean, maybe naively, I was extremely surprised at the elation in the Arab world about Nasrallah's death. Unlike when Hania was taken out uh, from Hamas and where everybody condemned that, it seemed like 
there were actually Arabs rejoicing in the streets and there were Syrians, the Syrian rebels were rejoicing over his death and, and many others, even Palestinians, Palestinians uh, who are definitely not pro-Israel, but they were thrilled that Nasrallah was taken out. So I, I try to look at a variety of sources. I don't want just one because you never know where they're getting that information. I'm even careful. Like I realize when I say, when I'm doing these talks, I, I, um, I hope I'm not representing too much of just one side or one narrative. I, I think the big picture that I just read an article today where somebody said he was talking about, and it was from an Armenian perspective, uh, you know, who's better for Armenia and Armenia versus Russia versus Azerbaijan or whatever. And he said, there's too much binary thinking and we need to expand and not just be one or the other or, you know, one or zero. We need to go beyond binary and to um, give as many perspectives as possible, just be open to hear many viewpoints. So I do think that's really important when, uh, you know, approaching something like this, especially such a protracted uh, conflict as this. Well, now that you bring that up, I do want to ask you about that. I meant to ask you about this. So a couple weeks ago, there was a big front page in the Tehran Times, which of course is an Iranian government website, newspaper, but it talked about, um, I'd have to dig it out, but it, it talked about we have red we have red lines and you would think well they must be talking about israel but what they were talking about was the situation the sort of emerging conflict between iran and russia over the armenian azerbaijan corridor issue can you just like yeah. take a couple minutes and explain that since you have family up there yeah well um actually technically we don't they were in Turkey and, uh, oh, okay. you know, and, and forced out during the, the genocide. If you, uh, if you want to even find a map of that region, I could uh, explain exactly what, uh, what this is. Um, so Armenia is a Christian nation. It's the first Christian nation in the world. Just, just uh, to, just, just to give you a perspective of what kind of neighborhood it's in. So there's Armenia surrounded by Turkey, Azerbaijan, and Iran. So three, Muslim nations and Georgia to the north and the relations with Georgia are okay, not great. Um, but so, but they're hostile, hostile relations between Turkey and Azerbaijan. And some of that is historic, like with Turkey and the genocide, the Armenian genocide and with Azerbaijan recently um, for the, the war 2020. And then of course in 2023. So then you will see that where Iran comes in and why this little Christian nation of Armenia, that its main ally in the region is Iran of all places. So, all right, where is... So here's, uh, this is Armenia border. Here's Azerbaijan. Here's the Caspian. There's Baku. Oh, got it. Okay. Okay. All right. So Armenia goes um, down when you follow it, it. I thought it was more south, but okay. So well, I, I don't have my map oriented towards okay. the north. Let me well, let's say that little there we go. All right. That helps me a little. Okay. So that, so down there, the border of Armenia, it's very small. Like it's a little bit to your right, to your, um, it's this, that little strip of land that goes oh, down. over here no, by no, Azerbaijan. No, Azerbaijan, you're right. But then there's Armenia that goes down to Iran and you see, well, you right. see where Iran is. So you see the border with Azerbaijan is very large. Like they have a huge land border, right? So, right. and then they have this, Iran has the small land border with Armenia, right? Going, see down there at the bottom of Armenia. Right. Yes. Okay. So then there's. And what's the name of that corridor that everybody's been fighting over for a long time? Well, I I think they call do they call it the Zangor Zangwar corridor? I think that's what the Azeris call it. I'm not 100 percent okay. sure. Okay. And then there's um, a little strip of Azeri land, and then there's Turkey to the west. Right. So the issue is over this little part of our this part of Armenia that dips down into the border of Iran. Azerbaijan wants to create a highway that goes from its country 
to this strip of land. So I think we're talking about this region yes, right in exactly. here. Exactly. So Azerbaijan yes. wants the the the, the, want the corridor, yes. and Armenia wants to keep that corridor because it keeps Turkey, well, which Turkey and Azerbaijan, from working together. Well, they don't want a foreign country to have a highway that goes across. It's that it would it would basically cut cut it off. Like whether it cut it off from in the middle of the corridor or it cut it off on the border with Iran. Now, Iran also doesn't want this because Iran's only access is through Armenia. So, you you know, you can go to our, this is amazing for somebody who lives in Israel, you know, to go to Armenia and there's a lot of Iranians there. You know, and and um, the Iranian trucks driving through, and you know, for like this is where this is their route. So they. By the same to token, if you go to Iran, if you were crazy enough to do that, you would find a lot of Azeris in Iran. Right, right, in in the northern. Including the wife, I believe the wife of the Ayatollah is an Azeri. But that's. Oh, I didn't realize that. I think I'm, I I think I have that correct. So there's. So he's kind of invest, but it's kind of interesting. So Iran has the relationship with Armenia because they're trying to keep the Azeris right. in check. And I don't think they really necessarily trust the Russians. So there's Russia's trying to build this corridor down through there. And that was the Tehran Times saying, oh, this is one of our red lines. You can't cross yeah. these. Our borders are red lines. And we don't right. like what's happening, but that was sort of a message to Russia to back off. Right. Right. I mean, it would be problematic. It would really, it would cut off Armenia from, believe it or not, it's only ally in the region, which is Iran, which is, you know. Oh, here's somebody posted Nagomo, Nagomo Karabash. Yeah, Nagomo Karabash is the corridor area that's yeah, in dispute. Well, but that was it's a that's a little region of land that was um, reabsorbed or absorbed into Azerbaijan after a really bloody war, and then a um, a siege, a, a nine month siege by, by Azerbaijan, and that's a little bit um, north and now in a Azeri territory, but the Armenians claimed it as their own and the people that lived there were ethnic Armenians. But it's a, it's an old battle that goes back to Soviet times when Stalin said, hey, this is your land, this is your land. And then everybody went under the Soviet Union and it was never fully sorted out. So Armenia claimed that Nagorno-Karabakh is ours, obviously, because it's been ancestrally Armenian for so many years. And Azerbaijan said, no, it's ours. And so that's how the war broke up over broke out over that part. Okay. Well, we talked about that. We did. I don't know if it was earlier this year. You know, it's hard to remember when things yeah. that happened a month ago happened you because it's so much has happened that it, mm -hmm. so much is happening in a compressed time that yeah. time's all messed up. Time's all messed you up. Probably total I totally agree with you. Time is crazy. it's running like crazy. And um, and also we probably talked about it about a year ago because it just and it, it just happened in September 2023. And I was actually going to go to Armenia on October 6th. I had a meeting with some with Armenians and Israelis that have an NGO that they were going to go to Armenia to help the refugees from Nagorno-Karabakh. And I was going to go with them as, you know, and, and do some reporting from there. And that was October 6th. I was going to order tickets on October 7th. Never happened. We were like, then the world changed. So that was it. Well, it's been a crazy year. Look, I got to run. I know you got things to do. I thank you for doing this. Tell us again where people can follow you and like, okay. subscribe and that type of thing. Okay, thanks. Um, my name on the screen, Nick Chan. You can do nickchan.com. That's my website. Um, you can sign up for my newsletter. And then um, at uh, on YouTube, you can do uh, YouTube and at Nicoleness, N-I-C-O-O-L-N-E-S-S. -O 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 -S. Okay. Okay, I'm going to end the stream. Thanks, Nicole. I'm going to say goodbye to you on the other side after the stream. Everybody, thanks for listening. Please like, subscribe, and share. And uh, I will be on Stand Up For The Truth on Q90FM in Wisconsin. I think it might be streamed live on their YouTube channel, uh, but 
you'll have just check for stand up for the truth on YouTube. Um, it, it's possible that it might be streamed live. So Nicole, I'll talk to you in just a second, everybody. Thanks a lot.